Would you all please stand up and give Fergus a big Limerick welcome. Thank you very much. Very welcome, Fergus. Thank you, OK, we're going to open with a little icebreaker. Um, so it's an either or situation. So um, before we get chatting seriously. So Star Wars or Star Trek? Neither. Um, Star Trek. Gates or Jobs? Gates. Astrology or Astronomy? Astronomy. Windows or iOS? Oh. Neither. iOS. <laughs> San Fran or New York? New York in winter, San Fran. The rest of the year. Good answer. Bezos or Branson? Uh, Branson. House of Cards or Breaking Bad? House of Cards. Galway or Cork? Controversial. Not much of a choice, is it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Galway. Follow my wife from Cork. But... Dangerous. Barry's tea or Lion's tea? Oh, uh, Barry's. Soccer or rugby? Okay, we have the measure of you now. So, could you give a brief synopsis, Fergus, of your very interesting last 30 years? Oh my God, first of all, for your, thanks for mentioning the number, but given we went to school together. I'm allowed to, right? Al allowed to. Um, <laughs> so, I suppose a very quick part of history is I was fortunate enough that I was good at maths, so I studied applied maths, and then Somebody got this crazy notion that I could write code, and it was in the days when we wrote code with a chisel and hammer. And I got my first job after UL, as it's now is known, was in Silicon Valley, uh, writing mainframe code, and so I was a techie, which you would empathize with. And I spent, I suppose, the next 15 years in varying shapes and forms writing code or leading technical teams, worked for some great companies, Wang at its zenith, and Oracle in particular. Wang in Ireland or in the US? Wang in Ireland. And Oracle in Ireland, I ended up as technology director and used to give classes in database design and database optimization and those interesting topics. But started around the late 90s to get involved in explaining technology to people and started to get more into what we might associate with product marketing type of roles. So starting to move in front of people rather than being I suppose, the clever techie in the background. And it was a part of that, myself and um, two colleagues of mine in Oracle, Dave Jensen and John Appleby, were very interested in this whole notion of network computing, on-demand computing, what we now call cloud computing. And we spotted um, a little article in Business Week in this tiny, tiny startup called Salesforce.com. And John crafted an email. So if anyone ever wants to know, does outbound telemarketing work or outbound reaching to people? It does. And as a result of that, what happened was after several discussions, Salesforce asked us to set up their what was their first international operation, the three of us in Dublin. It was a tiny company at the time. And through that, we went to build on, you know, or help build, I should say, um, a very, very successful cloud-based company. It's the poster child for any of you that exist in our work in the software world. It's the, the poster child for the cloud industry. For those of you that may not be familiar with that, but are involved in managing your customers, you may have customer relationship management, etc. So I um, had various roles, ended up running a very large sales group there. Left in 2009, wanted to do my own thing, which I aptly called Thoman Technology to annoy Dublin people. I live in Dublin for my sins, so I just wanted to remind them of my roots. Very patriotic. And uh, so that's mainly about, about just me advising companies, particularly software, on their strategies for cloud and SaaS. 
And then another great company, as it turned out, came knocking on the door and asked me would I do the same again, called Marketo, and they specialize in what's called marketing automation or demand generation. And I set up their first international operation, took it through similar type of, of development over four years and helped establish the, all their international operations, sales, marketing, service, finance, etc. So blank sheet of paper. And about a year and a half ago, I said, my time is done, I want to go back and do my diploma technology stuff. And I don't know, a few weeks ago, you sent me a LinkedIn and here I am. Great, okay, that, that's really interesting. So after doing Applied Maths, you started working in Trilogy and Wang, um, very much like under the bonnet as mm -hmm. a techie. What then was the spur to change to the more marketing, customer facing side of the business? I suppose part of it was interaction with the sales group. So I, when I was in Wang, I was working with the internal IT organization, or we now call an NIS, so kind of office of the CIO and it's very interesting when you work with these very successful companies and particularly American companies that our culture particularly in Ireland was salespeople are like either the second-hand car salesperson or the guy selling Hoover's years ago putting the foot in the door to get to you know so very very negative view and I would have had quite a negative view of the role of salespeople but in American companies, you see the complete opposite. And you start to see that they are the value creators for a company, they're the people who make and build companies. And I thought, gee, this is interesting. And there's an element of us techies are doing all the hard work and they're getting all the credit. <laughs> kind of logic came into my mind. And so that kind of started to appeal to me. Um, I like to talk, I like to present. So there's an element of just innate skills that, um, for those of you old enough to remember Fela Limney in Limerick, where you stood up on a stage mm -hmm. and you presented whatever you saw on a postcard. Those kind of things always appealed to me. Um, and then there was that explaining of technology. So I think it's a combination of, you know, there is more to this sales environment in a company than just that negative view we would have traditionally had in Ireland. And these companies are doing interesting and exciting things. So whilst databases in their own right are reasonably technical and reasonably boring, their usage is fascinating. And their usage as an enabler for any type of business, any of you running an e-commerce business, will have some sort of a database structure, whether it's the relation of post-SQL, non-SQL, etc. but it's possible partly. So the uses and the cases of the technology and that idea of articulating value became interesting. So you were doing that in Oracle and seeing the value of, yeah. of, of that side of it, and then you saw this potential opportunity of this startup in San Francisco. Yeah. Did so you know Mark Benioff before that? I had met Mark as part of um, the foundation work that Oracle did on the charitable side, but not apart from that, not really. Uh, what was more appealing was that the whole business of software, not just the delivery of it, was going to change if this idea of network computing or utility software or on-demand software. So there was a shift happening and, you know, without boring the people here, people went from the mainframe to the mini to the personal computer to PC LANs, that kind of natural evolution that some of you may have seen. The software industry hadn't really changed that much. It was still like, write some code, put it on a CD, ship it, somebody installs it. Whereas, you know, utility software is no different than your electricity, okay? You come into this room, you turn a switch, the electricity, the lights come on. Very, very simple action. You don't care how it came to you. You don't know where it was generated, but there's huge complexity in that. And that's what software as a service was about. And that was going to, if it happened, radically change the whole software industry and not just the way of delivering technology but more interestingly the way we were going to sell it 
and where we were going to market it. And did he actually, was he the pioneer of the concept of... So there would be a group of them, I mean he would certainly be to the fore, um, and Larry Ellison of Oracle would have been okay. um, of that ilk as well. So there was a number of companies wondering how do you do it. So everybody had the idea, or several people had the idea, not everyone, but it was how do you do it, and not just in a technological okay. sense, but how do you market it, how do you sell it. How do you get adoption? All those kind of things we talk about now, like in social interaction. How do you create that viral work when there's no viral network? So that was 1999. Yeah. So that was 17 years ago. Yeah. For the benefit of the few people who mightn't have heard of salesforce.com, can you just explain the size and scale of them now and the impact they've made okay. on how so, we do business? You know, give or take, we we'll round off the numbers. It now has 19,000 employees. I think it'll do somewhere close to $8 billion this year, has a market capitalization close to $60 billion, um, is the dominant player in what's called the CRM, or customer relationship management world, but is much wider than that. It's in the infrastructure world as well for cloud computing in general. So it is one of the most, it's as successful as Google has been, or an Apple from the consumer perspective, so it's a multi-billion dollar company now. Yeah. So in, in, in 2000, when they were just a, a pop of a company with mm -hmm. what, less than 100 maybe yeah. employees, mm -hmm. yourself and two colleagues in Oracle saw yeah. an opportunity yeah. and reached out. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a really good book, Behind the Cloud, which I would recommend anyone to read by Mark Benioff. And um, it features, just reading through it, it features a little bit about yourself and your colleagues. If I would just maybe read a bit from that. So it's, it's uh, Mark Benioff speaking here in the first person. He says, our international foray began in February 2000 when Fergus Gloucester, David Dempsey and John Appleby, executives uh, who were running Oracle in Ireland, uh, read a Business Week article about Salesforce.com and emailed me saying, what are you doing about Europe? Clever opportunity, you know, to spot that. Mm -hmm. And then it was really interesting where uh, he went on to say they were living in a little basement in San Francisco at the time. Okay. Uh, it wasn't ideal, he says. There was a dreadful smell of garbage and a bad mouse problem. And he goes on to talk about his, his dog, which you might, you, might, you might elaborate on. And uh, he said, uh, the Irish executives came to our office wearing suits, but the rest of us were in our usual uniform of Hawaiian shirt, shirts, shorts, and baseball caps. Fergus seemed shocked by our informal attire and the no software doormat adorn, adorned with dolphins. And then he quoted you as saying, oh my goodness, what have we got an assessment for? This is too Calif California-esque. That's correct. <laughs> so, and what's interesting is I had actually lived out there in 1983, having graduated as uh, my work with Trilogy. So it wasn't like California was uh, new to me. But what was quite kind of interesting was the business world of Ireland was still quite formal. And it is true, we arrived on the 3rd of August 2000 in suits, so three paddies. We didn't wear ties, so we were risque, right? Okay. thought you were really cool. That were really cool. So we walk into this office, and Mark is sitting there, and Mark is a big man, right? He's 6'6", six, six, quite large. He's in his shorts, Hawaiian t-shirt. Okay, you're going to say, fair enough. But he's talking about the vision of the company. Now, we've just left three of the best jobs in Ireland, right, in the tech world to go and do this. Talking about the vision of the company, we're all there, yeah, we get that. He's talking about where you want to take it. He says, yeah, we get that. And we're funding, yeah, we get that. And after about 10 minutes, this little pup runs into the office. Dogs weren't allowed in the building, by the way. Runs over to a plastic fire hydrant in the corner and relieves itself. Mark stands up, claps, and says, well done, Koa, which is the name of the dog, lovely golden retriever. And that was the end of our meeting. <laughs> so the three of us are kind of saying... What, have we let ourselves in for here? And that is 100%, 100% true. But you know, if you see beyond that, and you see beyond uh, the caricature, etc., the core essence of what we were trying to do was very radical, Frightening, you know, if you look at it, for those of you that have an idea for your own business, it's like 
you know, nine people are doing it one way and you're the person doing it completely different. And we were that person and we were like the potential lunatics. So um, he, he must have um, been impressed with you anyway because you went on to be the senior vice president for EMEA for the next nine years, right? Well, yeah, you can go and ask him that yourself. But yes, I mean, it, it turned out to be very successful both at a corporate and a, and a company level. And as much of that was about evolving and willing to do different things. So instead of just the clever techie, to go and do marketing. And if you, you haven't done it, it's quite a daunting thing to do. You know, and some of you will have companies where your strength may be on the engineering side, but you're faced with the challenge of marketing. And all businesses have that, whether it's technological or consumer or B2B. And then it's like, okay, marketing is now going to shift. I'm going to shift the epicenter of that to somewhere else in Europe. We want you to go and run sales. And it's like, well, what's that all about? And it's, it's having that, you know, I suppose, willingness, confidence, a little bit of fear, apprehension to go and try it and find out, of course, like all things in life, it's, it's not as difficult as you, you, you think it is once you get into it. And it is about managing people, whether that's an organization with five or ten of us when we started out in Dublin, right up to hundreds. Ferguson, you put it in context how people were, how customer relationship management was, was, was worked before okay. the cloud. Were people, they were going on with floppy disks and Excel files? And so, there depends on, if you were a small company, you might be lucky to be doing, you know, the equivalent of an Excel spreadsheet, okay? And you had the names of people. If you were a big company, you were probably buying some product like a Siebel, okay? And in 2000, the Gartner Group reckoned the cost of deploying Siebel was about $18,000 a user. So in other words, you had to build all the infrastructure. Those were the days when your IT was inside the building, your network was inside the building, your operating system, your database, your application. Now that we've just built the thing, we didn't get all the consultants to come in and help us adapt it to suit our needs. And then eventually you get around to teaching all the end users to use it. So it's all on-premise solutions. All on-premise. So it cost a fortune. Yeah. Cost an, like 18,000. We were coming along saying, you can have the same thing for $50 per user per month. Now it's reasonable to say that if you had grown up in a world where something cost in the order of thousands of dollars per user, and somebody's saying that you can do it for $50 per month, that this stuff is crap, right? There must be something wrong with it. There's a catch and whatever. So a lot of it was about proof points. A lot of it was about finding early adopters and a classic business problem of selling to the people who were able and willing to use it now, not to the people who'd never use it at that point in time. Okay, low hanging fruit. Low, well, not even just low hanging fruit. It's the appropriate fruit. Okay. Because it's then about, because the difference between software and some other words is you can always evolve software and then make it richer and deeper and more appropriate for bigger companies. So you, but we had to earn the right to go up market. So, so you're starting from scratch. Where did you, so you were based in Dublin, yeah. Powers Court, mm -hmm. um, which is a beautiful place to be based. Um, and we went there because it was cheap. Oh really, wow. Well, not to do with how good it looked. So I had the nicest, I mean, this is a gorgeous view. Right, I had. If you any of you know Powers Court House in Enniskerry, the old house, the top floor, turret on the left was my office. Gorgeous view of these palatial gardens. Mm. But we were there because we could Gee. afford it. But it must have impressed people. When they oh, came. completely. But then again, that didn't matter to okay. us because we were selling into Europe. Into Europe. That's what I'm going to say. Where was your first market? What was so the our first market? Was predominantly had to be English speaking Europe. So the UK and the Nordics where, you know, even though they don't natively speak English from a business perspective, they're quite happy to use English because the product only existed in American English to start off with. Mm -hmm. And it's about the hard yards. It's about going out, traveling, meeting people, responding to any lead we got, no matter what, what it was, and seeing could we 
you know, bring them on an adoption thing. And it, the difference was, because we were selling a service, we weren't selling a product. The one thing we got right in the early days was, it's like walking into the hotel here, and the reception, how they treat you. And then saying, okay, I'm going to go into the bar and we see how they treat you, and then okay. go into the restaurant. So at each stage of the process, you want the quality of service. And that's true for any business. And Mark understood that. And because and of software, you implicated it in you know, all of us. It's a service. It's a service. And because of software, you were able to quickly iterate. You start to iterate, you start to create a cycle of these people use it, they like it, it does exactly what it says on the tin. Okay, because software had a very bad reputation in 2000. You had all the dot com failures. You had the big Y2K ripoff. What a time to start, yeah. Okay, good time to start. Great time to have dot com in your name. <laughs> yeah. But they're the cha- But then it's about execution. It's about you're delivering a service. And it's about understanding that I'm selling something that is of value and that comp- to sell it to them, I have to really understand why do they want this? Rather than the old days of, I sell you a CD, you give me a check, you're on your own. Because when you're selling software as a service, the biggest fundamental difference is that the power shifts from the vendor to the user. If the user doesn't like the service, you stop using it. No different today than you have an app on your phone. You download it, you think it might be of interest. You pay $2 a month or something. And if it's useless or not of value to you, you stop using it. So that's the predication of cloud computing. A company uses your product. If they like it, they continue to use it. If they see value, okay. If they don't, they stop. And it doesn't matter what the reasons are for them stopping. It could be their own ineptitude. Might have nothing to do with your product, but it still hurts you, the vendor. So the basic premise was you were the pioneers of selling business applications to enterprise over the net. Mm-hmm. But then the, the, the next layer then was it was a subscription model. Yep. And then how did you work your, how did you roll things out? Did you work like a partnership system or was it all direct sales? So initially it had to be direct sales because it was so different. Yeah. Nobody that had a channel would touch us because like everyone else has said, it's a bit weird, it's a bit odd, it's not going to last, okay? It's okay, it's a quirky little, it's nice for little companies, this stuff will never be serious. And actually, Siebel used to call us salesfarce.com, which we took as a badge of honor. <laughs> and, you know, in a sense, that was the biggest mistake they made as a company, because they didn't recognize the threat. But, you know, if you, if you look at it on something that's radically new, you have to go and do it yourself. But then also, because it was so disruptive to the business model of software, the traditional channels could not make money out of it. So we couldn't go to traditional channels. Even the system integrators in the early days didn't like it because if you're charging $50 per user per month, how can you charge, you know, $2,000 $2,000 a day if you're in Accenture to implement it. You've got a disconnect. And it's quite interesting and it's, it's you know, still early days, it's still 15, 16 years. But most SaaS companies that are operating in the solution side of the business, not the infrastructure layer side of the business, are still direct sales. Right. And, and equally, we found the customers want to deal with the service provider. Has the basic offering changed very much from the initial? It has changed in the sense of it's much broader. Like mm. Salesforce is no longer a CRM company. It does marketing automation. It does customer service. It in its own right is now a development platform. But the core essence of, you know, the pricing that was decided in 2002, 2001, sorry, for the Enterprise Edition is still the price of the Enterprise Edition, still the price of the Professional Edition. The model is fundamentally the same model. So then 
after nine years mm -hmm. and achieving sort of amazing things with the company, you move from the, the CRM sales sales facing to a market um, market uh, automated marketing um, platform, Marketo. So it was a slight shift, sort of an evolution. Um, was that deliberate that you liked yeah, sort of going I, into I've a new? Yeah, I've always liked um, software that I think solves real business problems. So I don't like software that is feature, just narrow feature centric. So what I mean by that is something like pipeline optimization wouldn't necessarily appeal to me. I liked um, Marketo, it was a very, uh, a very, again, a very good vision. Phil Fernandez, superb uh, CEO, brilliant vision of what he wanted to do, and how, because of the internet and because of the digital age, how everybody in this room buys things differently. And therefore, how they buy means, if they buy differently, they need to be marketed to differently and stuff like that. And in a sense, a marketer couldn't have existed 15 years ago because the internet it wasn't as, as well adopted as it is now. So I liked very much the thing. I also knew that at that time, CRM vendors, even though it was meant to encompass marketing automation, were really weak at that. So that kind of solution appealed to me, um, but it was tangential, certainly, as a marketplace. Um, the, the pools you go talking to were very, very similar. So I guess like the by the time the salesperson gets to speak to somebody now, mm -hmm. they have almost made up their minds. Well, yeah, I don't know which level you can take it to. You know, there are different studies, and some would say fifty percent of the, the buying journey is complete, right up to seventy percent. But it is not unusual, and I would imagine that anyone here buying a car, let's take that as an example, if you were. Some of you fortunately aren't of our age, but if they were of our age when they were buying their first car, you went into a showroom and the expert was the salesperson. In other words, the person with all the power. And all. So that is definitely true and there's a shift in the information balance. And that creates huge challenge for marketers as to how do you get yourself front and centric and that has to do with content strategies, you know, social strategies, etc. And Mark had lived in all that space, so it was a very interesting business problem. So start. Salesforce was predominantly sales, whereas Mark Keto was more marketing. Yeah. yeah. So marketing and sales, then how do you how do you suggest people deal with that friction or so, potential conflict? Yes, and it's where I spend a lot of my time <coughs> now. Is that if you're the CEO, or sales, to use that awful Californian word, you need to get aligned. Right. And, and it's very, very, it's quite frightening. No matter whether you have a three person organization or a 200 or a 5,000 person organization, go in and ask the person in sales what's a lead. And then go and ask the people in marketing what's a lead. And if you get widely different answers, you've got a bus real business problem. And as a CEO, you need to work to fix that because if the two main expensive pieces or components of your go-to-market strategy have a different view of what they're trying to solve, you end up spending an awful lot of money, even if you're successful, not to mind running the risk of failure. So it is absolutely key that even at the terminology level, you get agreement. And it's quite fascinating with companies. And it's that friction. It is good to have a healthy friction. But fundamentally, you know, any business needs to find leads. Whether if I have a shop in O'Connell Street and I want people to come into my shop as my leads, or I'm in the digital world and I want them to come to my website, or I'm in an omni-channel world, I need to find those leads. I need to find a way of qualifying those leads. I need to find a way of converting those leads into sales. I need to find a way of delivering the service of the product billing them, supporting them, and hopefully renewing them. So inbound marketing then is a big part of this, right? Mm -hmm. um, There's obviously social is spoken about as being, you know, the kind of sexy side mm -hmm. of things sometimes, but do you think email is overlooked? Oh, completely. And, you know, you can see that, that email has died many times in the, the mind of people. 
And I think the key is, like anything, you know, it's like, don't put all your eggs in one basket. You should not just have an inbound strategy. You should have an inbound and an outbound strategy. You should have a social strategy. You should have a mobile strategy. And what happens, and it's particularly true of the tech industry, I think more is most guilty itself around its own industry, is the latest shiny penny. So it's like, if we went back two years ago, we were taught, two, three years ago, it would be all social marketing automation. Now it's all mobile marketing automation. Well, no, it's not. It's just marketing across channels. And I think any company needs to say that I've got, what's my inbound strategy? And some of that is organic or SEO centric. Some of it is paid like SEM or PPL. But then I may have an outbound in the traditional sense of the word where I have people doing research and mapping large companies. I may have then nurturing, and email is a brilliant engine for either nurturing inbound or outbound or keeping the trickle feed. Now, not spamming people. So you don't want your marketing person, instead of being the CMO, to be a chief spam officer. But understanding that and understanding how people react. And they're all tools. That's all they are. And it's, it's how you use the tools. But like if I'm in a B2B world, social is kind of not likely. Email is much better. But if I'm in the B2C world, and if my cohort is generation X, Y, Z, or whatever yeah. we're calling them today, type of logic, then maybe some of the social channels. But the key thing with all of them, and this is where marketing automation and CRM systems kind of come together, is if you spend money as a business, on either Google Ads, or Facebook Ads, or email marketing, or event marketing. We hire the hotel room you know, here, and we invite people. You have to measure the return. What did I get out of it? How effective was it? Everything can't be down just to, didn't we have a lovely event? And wasn't that a lovely place? Mm -hmm. And people think we're lovely people. Fine. Measure. It has to be a harder edge to it. And that's where, again, going back to the systems world comes into play. So part of you know, the success of both Marketo and Salesforce came from the fact that you can now execute a global strategy from anywhere in the world. Yeah? Okay. So over the years then, it's evolved more. You know, what's your view now on a startup setting up in Limerick versus Dublin versus London, Berlin? So I think one of the beauties of the today's digital world is there is nothing to stop somebody with a good idea. Because software is just an idea, it's IP, right? Getting together, obviously, capable people to develop that solution. And they can immediately, in the, in the relative sense, have that available to any market in the world. You can say, I'm going to choose Azure, I'm going to choose Amazon, I'm going to choose force.com as my platform. And immediately, I can start interacting with different markets. Now that was not possible 15 years ago. And there were a huge number of just logistical barriers, and hence capital barriers, to trying to say I'm going to start a software company out of Limerick, Dublin, really doesn't matter, or Berlin. I mean, Berlin is going through a massive surge at the moment. So location has nothing to do with it, provided you have access to skill and you have access to talent. And in as much as then on the technology side, it ain't about the cleverest guys in the world. Yes, it is if you're doing an infrastructure layer, but you have to have people who can sell, you can have to have people who can market. And there is nothing to stop anyone setting up, like Salesforce have, the equivalent of a corporate sales hub in Limerick, selling right across Europe. So the potential is there. The infrastructure, if you look at it, when, when I set up Marketo versus even when we set up Salesforce, when we set up Salesforce, even in PowerScore, we had to have our own servers for email. We had to have our own switch. We had to have our own, etc., etc. In 2011, when we did Marketo, we just had a, a Cisco switch in the office and wireless routers and everything was in the cloud. So the infrastructure problem is solved for companies. 
the reaches, and people won't care whether your software company is out of Silicon Valley, Berlin, whatever, provided the service is good. Right. Okay. So there's great potential for people to take their ideas, and that's that's one of the the really really strong benefits looking at from my perspective of the cloud. Now, the flip side of the argument is the guys in Estonia can think the same way. Absolutely, yeah. And therefore yeah. it comes down to execution, it comes down to the quality of your, of your, not your idea, but the quality of your service, support, and all the mundane things that make business hard. Okay. That's really, really insightful and thanks for sharing all that. And um, just before we open up to the audience, I'm sure people have lots of questions. If you were to give just three tips for a startup in the audience here in Limerick, with, in retrospect, looking back on your <coughs> career, what would be the three pieces of advice you'd share? Um, I think it has to be, um, let's assume you have a great idea and take that as a given. And therefore, let's assume, and let's assume there's a market, yeah. right? Okay. So let's take some of the fundamentals off the table. And let's imagine that you then even built your product or service, to not to be technology. I think you've got to surround yourself with people you trust. So one of the reasons, you know, Salesforce worked was we had a strong group of people that we could carve out myself, Dave and John on the European side and then on the global side, you know, people like Mark and Frank and Dina Dahl and other people like that, you could carve out. So having a small group that you can trust, you know, to get advice from, not advice from outside third parties, because ultimately you got to make it happen yourselves. So that's number one. Number two, I think there has to be an understanding that what you're getting yourself in for is tough. Like this is tough going. This is not nine to five, and I'm sure there are many people here that don't need me to tell them that. But you know, starting a business from scratch is you have to be relentless. Okay. And then the third piece I would say is do detail use detail to give you directional information of what's working, what's not, and that's all about execution. It fundamentally has to be, you know, somebody else out there has got the same product, the same service, the same idea, and if they don't, they'll soon catch up. So you have to out-execute the competition, and that requires lots and lots of detail, and there's a responsibility on you to pay attention to the detail and attention to what the data is telling you. Okay, on that note, um, thank you very much. Um, can we give um, Fergus a big round of applause?